Hey, Don Smith here. Welcome to the Evangelize Me YouTube channel. I'm glad you're uh, joining me for this class. We're on number four of uh, our 40 Days to Transformation class, getting us through Lent. So, um, we've reached a milestone here where we have more people watching these classes online than we do in uh, the classes that I'm teaching in person, which is really exciting because we want everyone to learn about their faith, right? Um, and to grow in their knowledge and love of the Lord. And so um, that it's really awesome, and we're excited about that. The thing is that in the classes that I teach, I have a little basket that I put out. It reimburses you know, mileage and website and uh, production costs, all of that stuff. And so um, uh, if you are watching these videos online and you're enjoying them and would like to continue receiving them, uh, then please consider making a donation. Um, if you can, if, support us monthly, that would be the really helpful thing because our, we, we have a handful of monthly supporters that have supported us um, for years and, uh, and they're incredibly faithful. And, and it's, uh, it's a huge help because then we, we know that we're gonna have a certain amount of income and we can plan and make budgets and um, you know when we're teaching classes and where and all of that stuff. So, so uh, if you're able and, and willing to, uh, to become a monthly supporter at whatever you uh, can afford, then that would be really, Awesome. I hope you enjoy the class. God bless you. Welcome to the fourth class in 40 Days to Transformation. Our invitation is to give up negative, shame-based, fearful, and anxious thinking. Uh, and we have been in this process now for several weeks, so I hope that uh, uh, if you're listening to this, you're be you've become more aware of your thoughts that you become more aware of the little moment of grace that we talked about that we'll review in a minute, that, um, uh, that you uh, are, are you know, gaining uh, uh, an understanding of how lies work and what lies that you believe and what lies that you're resisting. <clears throat> and so today we're gonna talk about uh, resisting lies on a little deeper level. But first we're gonna read our, uh, our foundational scripture that says, do not conform yourselves to this age but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. And that's what we want, right? We want the perfect will of God for every moment of every day of our lives. <clears throat> And so this is the little diagram. Um, so you, you have that little uh, gap, that little moment of grace between a stimulus and a response. And, uh, and the important thing is to interject, to take advantage of it, and to interject the truth in there, right? And so that our response is based on the truth. <laughs> We talked about that last week, and so uh, this uh, passage from Corinthians where it says that we have to take thought, take every thought captive, and that this is our spiritual warfare, that this is the, uh, the battle that we fight to gain our own inner integrity, as the catechism puts it. <clears throat> and so, we're, uh, today we're going to look at the temptation of Christ from, uh, from Matthew's Gospel, and it's interesting because you... Um, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 3, you have the story of Jesus getting baptized, you know, the Holy Spirit descending on him uh, bodily, um, the voice from heaven, which says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Now, usually when we read the scriptures, we read uh, if we if we read the scriptures, we eat, we read them like one chapter at a time. Or we read like a little tiny section, so you'd read the story of the baptism and it would stand all by itself, and you don't have any context. And it's really, really important. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about scriptures tonight. Read the scriptures and 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 read chunks of scriptures. Read, you know, I mean, like a lot of Paul's letters aren't very long. You know, Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians. They only take half an hour, 45 minutes to read, and they're written as a letter, right? And so we'd be reading them the way they were intended to be read, right? And that's how you read a letter. You don't, you don't like get a letter in the mail and you read the first paragraph and set it aside and read the second paragraph tomorrow, right? Um, you, you read the whole thing. And it's the same with these, uh, these, these scriptures. And so we have this, this voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, which is a wonderful um, uh, you know, testimony, God, God's offering his witness to the uh, divinity of his son, 
and uh, also expressing his pleasure with him, which is interesting because Jesus hasn't done anything yet, right? He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't started his public ministry. He hasn't preached anything. And so uh, the fact that, that the Father is pleased with him apart from what he can accomplish, right? Because that's, uh, that's one of the things we value in the Western world is, is how much you can get done and how much you can get done efficiently, right? <clears throat> so, so the Father says, I'm pleased with my son, Jesus. I'm pleased with him. And of course, you know, we are in Christ. And so, you know, one of those things is like, do you, do you and I have the ability to hear the Father say to us, this is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased, even if we haven't been all that productive, right? Or we're not all that efficient. This is my beloved son. The interesting thing about this is this is the end of chapter three and the beginning of chapter four begins with this. Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness. Well, that's an important context, right? <laughs> It's a really important context. And so if you read the story of the baptism and then uh, two months later or three months later, uh, you read the story of Jesus being led into the wilderness, you, you don't make this connection, but, but you have this, this public affirmation from the Father. And, and Jesus immediately is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So you have to, <clears throat> you have to stop. And then last week, uh, we, we looked at a ton of truth, right? We looked at uh, the fact that I'm loved and that I'm never going to be separated from, from his love, that he's never going to abandon me, that I don't, he's going to take care of me. I don't have to be afraid and anxious and worried. Uh, all of those things, we looked at all of those things last night, profound truths, objective, profound truths. But this week, we might have found ourselves being led by the Spirit into the wilderness, now, when you, when you, there's a couple of things about this. Number one, that you notice that it's the spirit who is leading him into the wilderness, right? And wilderness experiences for us are those hard times. That's the time when the rubber meets the road, right? And, and so he, he's led into the wilderness. And so when you hear wilderness in the scriptures, you always have to think of the, the 40 years the Israelites spend in the wilderness, right? Because that's the context that's that's the theme throughout the Old Testament is, is God's faithfulness in bringing them out of slavery. That's the Passover, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so when you hear wilderness and, 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 you know, Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness, the Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness, uh, there's connections there, right? Important connections. Because it's in the wilderness that you have to learn to trust. And trust is the foundation, right? Because what we're doing is we have this objective truth from God, but we have to trust, right? We have to trust that that's the truth. We have to trust. God says he loves me. Am I really going to believe him, right? Am I going to trust that what he's saying is true? How do I know he's not going to pull the rug out from underneath me? Other people have told me they love me, right? And, and it hasn't always worked out right. And so this idea, like, okay, that this complete... Uh, unbridled um, trusting and surrendering is foundational. So <clears throat> you go on. And so the first temptation is this, uh, the first words out of Satan's mouth in this testing temptation thing is, if you are the son of God, so the father says, this is my beloved son. Uh, the spirit takes Jesus into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days. Satan comes at a moment of weakness, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and vulnerability and says, are you really the son of God? Right? That's really what he's saying, right? Like kind of challenging this idea, right? And so, so when you and I are are trying to get this truth, the truth of the reality of God and his disposition towards us, and we're trying to get that into our hearts, then, then this question is going to happen to you and I. If God loves me, then why is everything going wrong, right? If God loves me, then why did, it, why have, you know, all these terrible things happened in my life in the past? What, you know, like how, how's that connected, right? If, if you're the son of God. Notice <clears throat> Jesus' answer is that he quotes from a scripture. 
So uh, in the scriptures from Deuteronomy, it says, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Now, it's very interesting when you're, when you're reading the New Testament, if you want to learn, right, then you would always want to, like, okay, there's a quote from the Old Testament. You know, Matthew quotes the Old Testament all the way through his gospel. But, you know, Paul does too in his letters everywhere. Um, you know, you go back and you say, so, what's the context of this scripture? What's really going on? Why, why this scripture out of all of the scriptures of the Old Testament that Jesus could have quoted? One does not live by bread alone. Well, of course, obviously, the temptation is to turn stones into bread. He's hungry. <laughs> And the temptation is to use his divine power on himself for his own benefit, to use his divine uh, authority for his own needs, right? And, uh, and so he says, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And it's interesting because in this section of Deuteronomy, Moses is reviewing the history for Israel, right? This is... Um, uh, Deuteronomy is the, the fifth book, and so we've already gone through Exodus and Leviticus and all of that stuff. And so Moses is reviewing, and he's talking about how God fed them with manna in the wilderness. And then he, he says this right afterwards, like, you know, don't forget how God fed you with manna. And then he says, but one does not live by bread alone, right? But, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. <clears throat> it's a very powerful statement. And, and... Jesus is the bread of life, and he's being tempted to make bread out of stones by the enemy. And his response is that bread doesn't really matter. What matters is God's will, right? God's word. So that's kind of interesting, right? So, so, uh, so the next time the devil says it again, if you are the son of God, and then he quotes Psalm 91. Now, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of freaky to think that probably uh, the enemy knows the scriptures better than you and I do, right? And so he can use them. He can use them against us. So he quotes Psalm 91, and Psalm 91 is, a, is this powerful psalm about God's protection, his divine protection of his children. Uh, you know, whether there's a plague or whether it's a warfare or whatever it is, that you're safe. And... Um, and, and the quote from the devil is that, uh, you know, you could, you, the angels will catch you, right? And, <clears throat> and that you won't even bruise your feet. And so he takes him, takes Jesus to the top of the pinnacle. He quotes the scripture, like God's given angels charge over you, so they're going to keep you safe. And, uh, and says, you know, now jump off. Now, you got to think about, like, why would this be a temptation to Jesus? It doesn't sound like much of a temptation. Right? Like, I'm not going to jump on this, you know, I'd be dumb. But, okay, so now you think, it's like, okay, so the, the temple is the place of worship mm -hmm, for the Jewish people, right? It's the place where they gather to hear um, the word of God and offer their sacrifices. And these are the people, the, the very same people with the very same Lord who has been uh, nurturing them and calling them and rescuing them and forgiving them for thousands of years. And now he is amongst them in the flesh and he is about to begin his messianic um, ministry amongst them. And what a better place and what a better way than to get their attention by jumping off the top of the temple and then having angels catch you and have you land safely in front of in front of, uh, you know, whoever happens to be there, right? And then that would just be like, yeah, then everybody is going to know somebody has arrived on the scene, right? Dramatically. <laughs> and Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It's like, okay, test, testing God. That's interesting, right? And so what, what? What does that mean? Because, you know, it's interesting because the word temptation and the word testing is the same word. And it's translated in English depending on the context, right? And so, um, and so it, it basically has two or three different meanings. The first is a situation where uh, it, it's like an orchestrated circumstance to, to bring out, uh, you know, your heart's 
response, right? So it's to show your character. So you think about Job, right? And so he goes through his testing. What, what was the point of his testing? To show that he had deep faith in God, right? Which God already knew, but now Job knows, right? At the end of Job, he says, you know, I've, I've heard about you with the, with the hearing of my ears, but now I have seen you. Right? He has this revelation, he has this change that takes place. And so, so his, his, his test was to uh, display his character, right? So that's one way of testing. Uh, or, and then uh, the other way is to um, obviously seduce someone to sin, right? That would be temptation. Um, <clears throat> there is a third way too. Oh, yeah, it's those times when, uh, when the uh, like Pharisees come to Jesus and, and test him by, by uh, asking questions, right? And so what they're really trying to do is to trap him, right, into, into saying something so that they can have an accusation against him. And so that's another use of this word. So you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, don't, you, you cannot force him to do something. You cannot manipulate him into doing something. You cannot, uh, you know, basically uh, put yourself in a situation where he has to prove his character to you, which is, which is that first definition, right? That, so this idea of if Jesus throws himself off the pinnacle, then the father would be obligated, theoretically, to catch him and protect him. That would be like forcing God to reveal his caring nature. And so you go back to this scripture in Exodus, and it's a story of uh, when the Israelites are traveling through the desert and they run out of water, and they come to Moses. And it's really, um, uh, when you, you know, like if you read Exodus, and again, this is another uh, encouragement to, to read scriptures in, in order and read them in big chunks. Um, you, you read through that first 17 chapters of Exodus, and it's like miracle after miracle after miracle, the parting of the Red Sea, the plagues, the, um, you know, the, the manna, the, like every, everything is just like this miraculous uh, provision for them, you know, uh, a pillar of fire at night and a cloud during the day. Um, and then when they run out of water, they come to Moses and say, did you bring us out here to kill us? We wish you would have left us in Egypt as slaves, <laughs> Right. Uh, and so they have this rebellion against, uh, you know, it, it's towards Moses, but of course, ultimately, it's towards God. That's the context of putting the Lord God to the test. Jesus quotes this in this context of like, no, 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 like this is this is not how this works, right? It, it's it's I am following His will. <laughs> I'm not trying to make him do my will, right? And then finally, uh, the devil takes him and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in their magnificence, right? The temptation here is that Jesus, uh, the whole point of, of the incarnation, the whole point of his messianic mission is to redeem the world, to take the sins of the world upon himself and to bear them uh, on the cross so that we can... Um, be forgiven and receive divine life and eternal life. <clears throat> so uh, Satan goes up and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and all their magnificence and all of their glory and says, all of this can be yours without the cross. Like you don't have to follow the Father's will. I'll give you everything that you're gonna get. Like I'm, you know, like, like Satan's basically saying, I'm just as good as your father, <laughs> right? Except I'm not gonna make you suffer. You're not gonna have to um, uh, you know, um, go to the cross and suffer. You, all you have to do, oh, to, to simple, bow down and worship me. Which is, of course, exactly what the devil wants. He wants worshipers. He wants servants who are obedient to him. And so, of course, Jesus responds, you shall worship the Lord, your God, and him only. And again, this is in Deuteronomy, the part of the review from uh, Moses, and, and uh, the, the exhortation is not to worship other gods, not to worship idols. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only. So the thing about this 
is that Jesus quotes scripture. He doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have an argument. He doesn't use his own words. He doesn't, you know, like, you know, use logic or re like all he does in response to this temptation, the temptation to, to bypass suffering, right? And that's, that's a, that's a real human temptation. We, we hate suffering. Um, the temptation to prove that he is the son of God somehow, right? Or to doubt that he's the Son of God, or to demonstrate somehow <laughs> that what God said to him was true. He doesn't go for any of that bait. He just answers with a straightforward, simple scripture. So, I think that's a pattern for us, and I think it's an important pattern. So, Hebrews says that the Word of God is living and active. Right, and so this idea that it's uh, that that these aren't just words that are printed on a page, right? This isn't just a, a nice book to read to you know, like it has interesting stories and and wisdom in it. No, no, no. The Word of God is living and active, which means that it can have an effect, and and all of us have experienced this. All, all you, you know, like you, you've been at a mass at some point where the scripture reading, as soon as the scriptures were read, you were like, wow, that was for me. If you've ever had that experience, then you've experienced the living reality of the word of God, right? Words that were written 2000 years or 4,000 years ago come alive to you today by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so this idea that th these aren't just words that I'm using, but they're actually powerful in and of themselves. Isaiah says that God's word doesn't go forth without accomplishing what he wanted it to accomplish. And so you have um, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, my heart is deceitfully wicked, right? I don't know my own motivations. Lots of times I have done things that I thought were good and then afterwards I realized like, oh, I was doing that uh, for, out of shame or I was doing that out of pride. I was doing that out of fear. There's lots of times and then there's times when I do, you know, dumb things or wrong things and, and I realize afterwards like, well, that was, you know, like I didn't even, I didn't think about it. I was just acting on my emotions, right? <clears throat> and so this idea that the, that the scriptures can, can, discern by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can discern the deep things of our hearts that we're not even aware of. And that's one of the important things about the scriptures and knowing the scriptures and, and having the scriptures ready at hand so that you can use them and that God can use them. So we go on. It says, the inspired books teach the truth. This is from the Catechism. And, and of course, it's a, it's an, it's a, just knowing, again, the scriptures are true. Well, just like we did last week, they're objective truth, right? And so the Catechism says, in sacred scripture, the church constantly finds her nourishment and strength. Now, you, you remember, whenever you're reading anything, uh, whether it's in the scriptures or the Catechism or wherever, it, and it talks about the church, you have to stop. Right, because because what we do is like, oh yeah, the church, the universal, you know, family of believers, blah blah blah, which is of course true. But you are also the church, right? I am the church. So in sacred scripture, Don constantly finds his nourishment and strength. Constantly finds nourishment, spiritual food and strength. Now we've been talking about this battle for our mind, right? Where do I get the strength for this battle? I get it from the sacred scriptures. For she welcomes it not as a human word, but as what it really is, the word of God. In the sacred books, the Father who is in heaven comes lovingly to meet his children and talks with them. What a beautiful image that is, right? What a beautiful image that in the sacred books, the Father is coming 
to meet with you and I. And he's coming to meet with us not as a, um, you know, a lord or master, right? Not as the ruler of the universe. He's coming as our dad, coming to meet lovingly with his children and talks with them. So this idea that, that like God is speaking to us, right? He speaks to us all the time. He's always communicating to us. You know, Jesus used this phrase, to those that have ears to hear, right? And so we need ears to hear the loving Father talking to his children in the scriptures, right? We need the ears to hear uh, God communicating his love to us through the beauty and goodness of this world. <clears throat> and so, so again, we have this encouragement. Okay, so the scriptures are they're living and active and powerful, and they're also a place of nourishment and strength, and they're also a place where God the Father speaks to me. All right, so what I want to encourage you to do, and probably some of you have done this already, but it's a wonderful discipline and a wonderful practice of memorizing Scripture. You know, when Jesus is in the wilderness and the, and the enemy comes to tempt him, he doesn't have to, uh, he doesn't have to wander, right? He doesn't have to, uh, you know, like, oh, like, what, what, what book is that in? What, what scroll is that, right? But it's right on the tip of his tongue. It's right in his mind. It's right in his heart. And that's the, uh, the beauty of memorizing scripture. It serves several functions. First of all, um, you know, when I used to drive for FedEx, um, sometimes I went through a season where it's like, okay, I got I to gotta refocus my brain. Um, and, and I'm, I'm kind of like the Israelites in the, in the story of Judges. Like I do good for a while and then I fall off the, off the wagon and, and, you know, start thinking negative thoughts and fall into a hole. And then it's like, oh man, I don't have to be in this hole. I just have to discipline my thoughts. So, so I was going through one of those seasons. It's like, okay, I got to start memorizing scriptures again. And so, uh, and so I make, get a note card and I'd write the scripture on it and then I'd tape it to my dash and, you know, being FedEx. You get in and out of your truck a hundred times a day. And all I'd do is just like glance at the, the next line in the scripture and then I'd repeat it as I'm driving, right? And then I'd get there, I'd glance like, yep, I got it right. And then I'd come in and like, okay, the next section. And, and so, you know, like you can memorize a scripture a day, really, right? Or you can spend a whole week memorizing a scripture, whatever. But it's occupying your mind, right? I mean, like, you know, that whole idea of like, okay, my thoughts are like out of my control. It's like, well, that's one of the way of directing them, right? And directing them in the right direction, directing them in the truth. And so if you have a lie that says, nobody ever cares about me, or uh, God is always abandoning me, or, you know, you're, you're wrestling with anxiety, then it's a wonderful practice to find a scripture that addresses that and memorize it. Think about it, because what you end up doing is meditating on the scripture all the time that you're working on memorizing, right? The whole time. And so this, this idea of, um, of getting, getting it into my head, and lots of times, I'm like, I'll be super familiar with the scripture, but when I start memorizing, I think, wow, that's an interesting word. I wonder why he uses that word in this context, right? Why does he phrase it this way as opposed to this way? And, and, and it, like, you're, you're meditating, on the scripture the whole time that you're memorizing it. So, so you're occupying your main mind with good things and you're uh, putting the truth into your heart. The other thing is that it's there when you need it. I can remember years ago um, when I was a pastor of a Protestant church and um, one, of, one of the people in the church called and said, you know, the, her husband had uh, had some kind of incident and uh, they were on their way to the emergency room, and could I meet them there? And so I did. <clears throat> I met, met them at the emergency room. Uh, they took him right in and started working on him. And uh, she was an older lady, and so we prayed together. And then I was sitting, waiting with her. And at some point, after a period of silence, I said, I said, Doris, what are you thinking about? And she said, I'm just repeating the 23rd Psalm in my head. It was something that she could cling to, right? It was something that she, she had accessible to her accessible, this, um, 
you know, this, this comforting psalm, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil, right? Um, years ago, some of you know, um, well, 15 years ago now, um, I had a brother who got murdered and, uh, it was, you know, it was a nightmare. It was a, a robbery and he was shot and, um, and it really was a terrible thing to go through. Um, and for months, for months, I just clung to Romans 8.28, right? I just clung to the scripture that says, God is able to use all things for good, right? He's even able to bring good out of something that's evil. And so I clung to that scripture. I just, it's just like, okay, I, <sighs> every day, day after day, God's going to bring good out of this. God, God's going to bring good out of this. And so they, they become foundational for us. They become the new belief system to replace our lives. And so this idea that, um, uh, that, that we're going to need these truths I can remember a period of time because I've really struggled with the idea of God loving me, right? And, uh, and what my human definition of love means and, and like if God loves me, why is my life such a mess and all of that stuff. And um, I can remember we, we uh, Hollis and I had a, a, tr a trailer that we uh, were renting and, um, and the people renting it called and said, there must be something wrong with this sewer system because it, it, something smelled terrible here. And so I'm thinking, yeah, oh, that's not good. Like, like <laughs> it's never good. Sewer systems are not good, right? So I'm, I'm all the way down to, to to look at it. I'm thinking, oh, please let it be, you know, something on the on the trail on the rental part. And, you know, we rent the lot that it sits on, and so it's like, let it be that, so that I can just call the trailer park and be like, no, you need to take care of this, right? So I get there, I, I you know take the skirting off, and, and I shine my flashlight underneath. Now you gotta remember, there's a you know, you know, it's underneath the trailer. It's only like a foot and a half, uh, maybe two feet, and I can see with my flashlight that the sewer pipe is broken right off. So it's 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 my problem now, right? It's not the it's not the park's problem, and apparently it's been broken for a while. <laughs> okay, so if if you can imagine having to crawl underneath the trailer and, and you know keep in mind that I hate spiders and the thing is just full of spider webs. There are spiders everywhere. There's no getting away from spiders, right? There's just they are there. They are everywhere. Uh, and so so that would be bad enough. If I just had to crawl underneath the trailer with the spiders and the spider webs, that would have been bad enough, right? The other thing is that the pipe was actually in the center, and so there's these beams underneath, and you had to crawl underneath the beams, and the beams, it was just wide enough for me to squeeze my chest through. So, like, I had to, like, pull myself through <laughs> this little narrow spot, which kind of pushed my buttons, because I get panicky when I can't breathe for some reason. <laughs> anyway, um, then I had to, like, use a scoop and put it into buckets and then push the buckets out and fill up another bucket and then crawl out around the buckets and pull them out and, and go dump them. So, and I can remember I, I, it was a really a profound experience because I've been meditating on God's love for me and that I'm, I live and move and have my being in, in an ocean of love that I am, um, that love is the ruler of, of the universe and he's the ruler of my life and, and love only does what is best. Love only does what is best for the other. <clears throat> and I can remember uh, being underneath that trailer in that really disgusting place and thinking, God is, God is loving me right now. God, this is, the, this is the best thing that could happen for me today because, because God loves me and he's the ruler of the universe. And so I don't, you know, like, I don't know why I, you know, why I need to have this experience, but I don't have any doubt that God loved me. And, and something changed, right? Something was cemented inside of me where the old question of like, does God really love me? Now I have been in the wilderness and I have a 
affirmed my belief in his love. I hope that makes sense, right? Because the wilderness is where you're, you're tested and tempted. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's where we have to decide, are we going to trust this God even though we're out of water? Uh, are we going to trust this God even though we're in pain? Are we going to believe that God loves us even when there is no evidence of his love in our circumstances or in our emotions, right? But that's the idea of that objective truth. It is true, and I can choose to believe it, and I can choose to trust it. So memorizing scripture, I highly encourage you to find scriptures that speak to you. Um, and then also writing scriptures down and having them around to remind you, right? I was at my sister's house visiting a couple weeks ago and, uh, uh, you know, when it went in the bathroom and there's a scripture on the mirror, I don't even remember what it was, I think it was a psalm. And, uh, and, and I thought, like that, like, and, and I, actually I meant to have a conversation with her and I didn't, but it's like, why did you choose that scripture, right? That the, the first thing you see in the morning and the last thing you see at night, there's this like little declaration of truth. And, uh, you know, like, do you ever change it? Has it been there for a long time? What does it mean to you? Why that scripture, right? Because there's a reason why. And I appreciated that. It's that, that idea of like, okay, find a scripture that really speaks to you. The, the, you know, the Lord giving you a scripture and being able to uh, be reminded of it on a daily basis. Speaking of that, when you're reading the scriptures and memorizing scriptures, it's a great idea. It's a really important idea to, to, to mark the, the passages that speak to you or encourage you or the ones that you have questions about or the, the, the references that you want to look up, right? And so sometimes in, in my Bible, you will have a, a little, uh, you know, you'll have a story and then it'll, you know, it'll have the little number, like number two, and you get down to the bottom of the page of number two and it's a quote from somewhere else. And it's like, and you look that up and it's like, oh my gosh. And so, like, I'll just go up and, like, circle that number, like, look up this reference. Because the reference really tells you what the scripture means, right? So, and so, underline. So, I wanted to bring my, um, when I was teaching this class in Lewiston, I wanted to bring my wife's Bible. Because she's had the same Bible for 40 years. Same Bible. And she has written all through it. There is not a page in that Bible that doesn't have something underlined. Um, and it's very cool because lots of times she'll date it or make a little note or something like that. And so, uh, you know, our son joined the Marines. And on the morning that we were taking him uh, to Portland to get on the bus to go to boot camp, uh, she was reading in Isaiah. And there's a scripture in, in Isaiah that talks about keeping your offspring safe. And so there's a little note, you know, 2000 whatever, Isaiah boot camp. And, it, and, and, and you know... That was, what, 10 years ago. You, you'd probably never even think of that again. It, you know, if you, did, if you didn't underline it and make a little note, you'd never think of it again. But now, like, you just open up her Bible, and there's all these little references, all these dates, all these things that are underlined, and little draw lines around, and things circled. It's like a treasure trove of truth. And so I encourage you, you know, have a Bible that you can read and write in and make notes in. And if your Bible's too fancy for that, then go get a cheap one, right? It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you are encountering God. You're hearing God's voice through those scriptures. And so make it your own. Nourish and strengthen yourself with the scriptures, is what the Catechism says. And so finally, no pun intended, finally, brothers, Paul says, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. Now, Paul is giving them instructions on how to live, right? So he gives them instructions about prayer. He gives them instructions about morality. And, and, his, and he says, finally, brothers, after this list of instructions, Think on these things. Now, notice that that's not really a suggestion. Like, like it, it might be a good idea to do this. No, no, this is like this is how you live the Christian life. You think about things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and, and admirable, and 
excellent and praiseworthy. Focusing your mind. See, you notice if you're thinking about these things, you're not thinking about the anxiety and stress and worry. And, and the problem is that our world is addicted to negative news, right? And, the, and of course, it's all industry and greed driven. They want you to be afraid, right? They want you to feel like I have to find out what's going on today, right? And so, um, so the idea that you could, uh, uh, you know, shut off the news for the day, right? That you could shut off your phone for a day and be disconnected from this world, be disconnected from the social uh, networks, right? Now, now for some people, that feels like it's like, oh my gosh, like I, I wouldn't dare to do that. Like something might happen. And I wouldn't know it. Something might happen and I would miss it, right? But 99.9% .9 of the stuff that we put in our brains that we worry about and are afraid about and all of that stuff, we have no control over, right? Now, now it, I'm not saying we shouldn't be informed because we're, we live in a democracy and it's important that citizens be informed uh, about the, what the politicians are doing and what federal agencies are doing and things like that so that we can vote and hold people accountable, and that we can write letters to our senators and do all of those things that good citizens do. But that doesn't mean that I have to wake up every morning and say, oh, did Russia bomb Ukraine again last night? <laughs> right? I don't have to do that. I'm pretty sure that if World War III breaks out, I'm going to hear about it. <laughs> right? Um, and so, and then also, of course, there are negative people. There are people who, uh, you know, I'm, I was tempted to say they like being miserable. I don't think they like being miserable. I, I've done this in my own life. I have chosen to be miserable for seasons of my life, right? I have, I've made choices that have made me miserable by the things that I thought, the things that I engaged in, the things that I watched and listened to, right? Uh, I used to listen to talk radio every day, all day, day after day, right? It wasn't healthy for me. It made me angry, made me depressed, made me scared. <laughs> Paul is saying, we need to put ourselves in a position where we are able to think about these things and keep these things in front of us, to keep these things occupying our minds so that we can experience the peace that God has for us. This is the path to peace. Getting rid of fear and shame and anxiety and replacing it with what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Imagine how different our lives would be if, if all we thought about were good things. Next week we're going to be looking at uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and, uh, and being engaged in this battle and, and revisiting some of this because uh, the Word of God, the Scriptures, the living word of God is the sword of the spirit. And, uh, and, and Paul gives us some advice about protecting ourselves and how to use that sword. <clears throat> so thank you for joining me. I pray that you're finding this helpful. Uh, I, I hope that uh, in these battles against these thoughts and taking captive every thought, you are um, a growing in your knowledge of God's goodness towards you. Thanks for joining me. I'll look forward to seeing you next week.